Jason Felivor, Product Group Manager um, of Aerospace and Specialty Optics and Marketing Manager here at Iridian. And uh, as Nicholas mentioned, this is uh, my second go around, uh, the second uh, International Space Convention event. I participated in the, uh, the one in the fall and, and uh, delighted to be able to participate again and, and talk more about our optical filters and um, applications related to space. Uh, so I'll begin with an introduction to who we are at Iridian. So Iridian is a, um, a Canadian company. Uh, we, we manufacture um, optical, custom optical filters. We have about 180 um, employees all working out of that building that you see there, except folks like me when I'm working remotely from home like I am uh, most of the time now. But uh, everybody works out of the building there. All of our R&D development, sales, and our manufacturing all happens here in, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, you know, all the manufacturing is done here. We're an ISO 9001-2015 certified company as of 2016, renewed every three years or so. And uh, we're registered as part of the Canadian Controlled Goods Program, and that enables us to deal with, well, controlled goods, so things requiring um, specific uh, documentation control, export permits, et cetera. And we've been in this building since, since 2012. I used to have in, in, the, in our new building, but it's, it's not so new anymore. We've been here for a decade. And uh, if this picture was taken a year from now, the, the cars that are in the parking lot there would be uh, underneath the, the soon to be added on second uh, story above the parking lot because we are, we are growing and uh, need more space. So as I mentioned, fundamentally, we, we are an optical filter manufacturer, but we, um, our, our technology, it's not, um, not color glass filters, holographic filters. We make uh, multi-layered dielectric thin film optical filters. And also uh, optical filter arrays um, for or one of the examples is Earth observation that I spoke about in the fall. Um, the wavelength range that we cover uh, with our capabilities spans from the upper end of the UV, about 300 nanometers, all the way out into the long wave infrared, approximately 15 microns and perhaps beyond, depending on uh, specific needs. Almost everything we do is customized. We have, um, a, is it our website? You'll find a web catalog. Really, that's, that's, there's some spectroscopy filters there. It's really a, a place for people to find out what we do, but really when we're looking at, at working with folks that are developing a particular uh, uh, instrument, like the telescope I'll talk about today, um, a camera for an Earth observation, a system, very much like Hero was talking about, we do a lot of work, uh, and I, I spoke about it in the fall, on optical filters in optical intersatellite links for SATCOM. So customized solutions for customers like that. The types of filters we make are single band pass, um, edge pass, notch, multi-band, multi-notch filters, uh, as well as multi-zone filters. I mentioned the filter arrays uh, for things like earth observation. The sizes vary from sub-millimeter uh, in our telecom, terrestrial telecom, uh, datacom applications, uh, very small optical filters for fiber optic uh, communication networks up to fil filters in, in excess of 150 millimeters in diameter, like the, um, the filters I'll be talking about today. And the technology that we use um, is, I mentioned multi-layer uh, dielectric filters. We use mag energetic magnetron sputtering is our dominant technology. We have 25 coating chambers, different geometries, different configurations set up to, uh, to, to do that. And one of them that also can, can handle evaporation, which lets us push above 10 microns as the materials that we can sputter start to go dark about 10 microns. So we need evaporative materials to extend into the very long wave infrared. These deposition systems are controlled by custom design and control software. The coding runs can vary from hours to days, uh, hundreds, thousand layers. Uh, and so we need to do in situ optical monitoring where measurements are taken along the way, optimize, and then the software automatically optimizes for subsequent layers to keep the design on track. We also have, we're not just a coding company though, and really I don't like to think of us as a coding company. We are a filter company. We're gonna deliver a final filter. In this case, you'll see the filters that we're delivering for the, for the uh, telescope I'll talk about today. Through our polishing group, uh, processing, sizing, dicing, coring, test and measurement. We have a photolithography lab for, for the arrays. So we, we have a we have full, full uh, tip to tail end to end uh, capabilities to convert glass into a finished filter product. So I'm, uh, Nicholas mentioned, I'm, I mentioned it as well. So I'm, again, first time around, this is what I, sp I spoke about, optical filters in space, uh, optical filters for Earth observation. So filters that are flying in orbit, uh, taking um, um, me measurements or, or, or spectral measurements of the Earth, either single band uh, optical measurements or multi-band uh, measurements as multi-spectral imaging. 
And I also spoke about optical filters, as I mentioned, for optical intersatellite links for sat SATCOM, the dichroic filters, bandpass filters, solar rejection filters that, that do the wavelength selectivity needed in that, that, uh, that laser communication in space. So the, the theme in the fall that I spoke about was optical filters actually flying in space and what they're doing in space. But um, this time around for the spring, I thought, uh, I thought I'd change it up and I'm gonna talk about optical filters looking into space. So terrestrial applications, but uh, involved with space and optical filters, and that's astronomy. So uh, I'm not gonna be talking much. He's a, a little bit of a hero of mine when I was uh, a lot younger, Galileo. I'm not gonna be talking about Galileo and his, uh, his telescopes and the, the, the moons of Jupiter, um, but I am gonna talk about that uh, telephoto array, that, that really interesting and unique uh, telescope that you see on the right there, um, Dragonfly. And I'll talk about uh, the, the role that optical filters play in, in, in enabling its capability and what's special about it and what's special about the optical filters that have to be used with it. This is a slide that I uh, put up almost all the talks I, I, I use, particular things like Earth observation. You can't measure something, you can't manage it, you can't understand it. Well, we're not going to be trying in astronomy to manage uh, astrophysics and manage galaxies and uh, circumgalactic media, but in order to understand our place in the universe and, and the matter and, and energy around us, dark matter in particular, we need to be able to measure it. And there has been a, a, an inability, in particular in dealing with dark matter, to be able to act, actually measure it, not just theorize about it. Dragonfly actually takes some steps to uh, to resolving that, and hopefully, if if the folks with the the, uh, the telescope can now measure um, the dark matter or or uh, remnants associated with dark matter, then we'll be better be able to understand this this component that makes up the vast majority of the, the mass in our universe. So, what role do uh, and I'll talk more about Dragonfly, of course, but I'm going to start by talking about why optical filters are used in astronomy. So, well, why not? Galileo didn't have optical filters with his telescope, so why do we need them now? Well, it's really about getting more signal, less background. And that's something we talk about at Iridian a lot. It's what our filters do. They let you see the light you want to see and not see the light that you don't want to see. So in astronomy, this means seeing particular um, gas lines that are, that are being emitted by, by stars, galaxies, gas. Uh, and, and not seeing the background information. So selecting a particular uh, gas line of interest, it's gonna uh, illuminate a particular phenomena for you. See the signal and not the background. On the upper left, I've shown, you can see a, a number of different gas lines uh, and their place in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, on, the, on the right, it's an example of an optical filter I found online. You can buy these filters for a few hundred dollars, about an inch or two in, in diameter, about a 12 nanometer bandpass that'll let you see that H alpha line um, that, that might be might be valuable in uh, in astronomy application. So H alpha in particular is 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 important to be able to, to image nebulae and other other objects that are rich in ionized hydrogen. So by looking at that 656 and change uh, line, you can separate H alpha from other gas lines and other other sources like only look at it. The, the uh, image in the center of the screen is one that I took off uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, uh, um, credited there. Uh, this is a composite image showing the sun in white light on the right and in H alpha on the left. So in H alpha, we can actually see into the chromosphere, see the layer directly above the photosphere. So much more information is, is able to, uh, to be gleaned from this image with an optical filter in place. But the optical filters here I'm talking about again are, are, are these. 12 nanometers wide, about an inch or two in diameter. And that just won't work with this beautiful uh, telephoto array that I'll be talking about today, Dragonfly. So this, I'll, I'll talk, the next few slides will be about Dragonfly and the information is provided by um, Professor uh, Roberto Abraham and uh, Deborah Lockhorst. She was a grad student. She now works at the National Research Council of Canada's Hertzberg Institute as an astronomer. So they, they provided with a lot of the information on Dragonfly and it was their team at the University of Toronto's Dunlap uh, Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, uh, combined with uh, Peter Van Dokum, Professor Peter Van Dokum's team at the Yale Department of Astronomy, back in 2014, that invented this new type of telescope, this uh, Dragonfly Telephoto Array, or Dragonfly for short. And it's constructed by combining a large number of high-end photographic lenses uh, together to, to gather one image stitched together from all these, these, these individual uh, lenses. And as a consequence, it's, it's the, with a 48 lens system that was the original Dragonfly, 
it was essentially equivalent to, um, to a one meter aperture refractor, which is the largest in the world and operates at a very fast uh, 0.39, F over 0.39 focal ratio and a large six degree, degree, six square degree field of view with very uh, low um, scattering, order of magnitude lower than conventional telescopes. And hey, I'm not an astronomer. At, uh, so again, this information is, is from the team at Dragonfly. So at the end, I'll be largely answering questions on uh, filters, not, not the astronomy aspects, but this is, this is Dragonfly is, is really, really unique and really different than conventional telescopes. And it was, it was able to make a, a series of groundbreaking discoveries um, looking at an area of astronomy that really hadn't been looked at too much uh, previously, which is the study of the low surface brightness universe. And that's become one of the hottest areas of astrophysics. And they made a very exciting discovery of ultra diffuse galaxies, um, which is a new population of objects that, that are great laboratories for investigating the nature of, of dark matter. The way Dragonfly did this is coupling these new technologies, this, this ability to have this large field of view, low scattering and um, um, ultra fast uh, focal ratio, um, but also doing it in a way that's commensurate with a student's um, degree program. JWST is a wonderful space telescope, absolutely mind-blowing the information that's coming back from JWST. However, it took literally decades uh, to, to develop and get into space. So if somebody's working in a, on it as part of a degree program, you know, by the time they're, they're, they're the, the system's up and taking data, their, 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 their career might be over, let alone their degree. This, this telescope was able to be put together relatively quickly in the course of a few years. And that was part of the mantra that the teams at the universities wanted to, to be working on. Rapid instrument de development, uh, instrumentation development, but also uh, really groundbreaking capabilities to study this low uh, background, ultra diffuse, um, uh, low surface brightness uh, universe. So I'll talk more about that, that, uh, that what, what a dragonfly as a telescope actually delivers. So there's seemingly empty space in between galaxies, but it's, as, as mentioned previously, it's predicted to be full of dark matter mixed with hydrogen gas. And in between galaxies, the, the gaseous material traces out a, a giant filamentary structure. Uh, so it's the dark matter cosmic web. And as these filaments approach galaxies, but still far beyond the stars in the galaxies, this intergalactic medium, the IGM, transitions into the circumgalactic medium, the CGM where reservoirs of gas uh, in the CGM are controlling processes of galaxy formation. But we know almost nothing about the CGM in the nearby universe, because when we look at galaxies, by looking, focusing on their starlight, as in the, the center, center uh, diagram, we see the stars. We see the, we see the, the bright uh, images. We see the, the trees, and we don't see the forest around it. So if Instead, we could detect the gas, the, 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 lo the low uh, uh, light level background gas and, and block out that, that high brightness starlight, then we'd have a very different uh, view uh, on the right of, of, the, of the universe and, and galaxy, uh, ga around galaxies around us uh, and get a better information about this, uh, this circumgalactic media and, and these, these areas that are really fueling uh, galaxy evolution and and telling us about the structure and, and uh, uh, formation of dark matter. So really uh, critical astrophysics and groundbreaking astrophysics potential if we can see the forest instead of the trees. So how, how to see this, the uh, circumgalactic media distinct from the brightness of the stars? Well, the team at Dragonfly decided by using ultra sensitive, very narrow band imaging, they'd be able to isolate velocity shifted hydrogen alpha lines with high contrast. So by looking at the very narrow slices of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that led to upgrading Dragonfly. This is, uh, and, and by doing it, by using Iridian's filters. Um, so the team uh, decide, uh, determined that if they could get a filter that would be manufactured with a very narrow bandpass, sub nanometer. So in contrast to the 10, 12 nanometers that I showed previously on um, sort of standard astronomical filters, and then the, if the filter could be tuned over a narrow wavelength range, its transmission profile could fit in between night sky lines and completely avoid contamination. And using that capability along with Dragonfly's ability to very um, uh, use different lenses, looking at different parts of uh, different uh, spectrum, they'd be able to really eliminate that background contamination. Again, eliminate the, the, uh, the background and see more signal, or in this case, actually eliminate the signal and see more background. 
And uh, they also were uh, in doing so also increasing the number of lenses they were working with from uh, 48 lenses up to approximately 120 different lenses on, on, on different mounts that uh, could be deployed and uh, simply and easily. So this is uh, some early, early results from Dragonfly 2.0. Just got this from, from Deborah uh, Lockhorst uh, just, just yesterday, actually. So uh, they're down in New Mexico. They're, they have a Dragonfly, and they're starting to deploy it now. Uh, and so this is an image um, using a three nanometer filter. We also have uh, uh, sub uh, nanometer filters, but a three nanometer filter to look at a, a very specific uh, H-alpha uh, line shifts. And the red patch in the upper right here uh, uh, labeled H alpha shell as a giant gas cloud that Dragonfly was able to discover in the H alpha data. And this is beyond the range of previous H alpha emissions detected in, the, in this group of galaxies. The zoomed in section of the M82 galaxy that you see there is, it highlights a, uh, a early uh, nascent tidal dwarf galaxy. And that was also discovered with this data. So this is, this is only capable with Dragonfly and only capable by using a narrow band optical filter to, to select the, uh, to avoid that, that, um, that the bright starlight background. This is, this is really uh, the, the key slide that illustrates this. So that red, red bar on, on this, this slide shows the, that's a 10 nanometer bandwidth filter. So if, if that filter were to be used, it's, it's much wider, uh, wide enough that many of these uh, um, uh, night uh, spectrum emission lines are covered by that filter. So it's going to, you're going to be seeing a lot of that, that uh, emission line background contaminating the, the image. Instead, you can see in green, if they can get a, a very narrow slice of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum sub nanometer and position it specifically, they could actually drop that filter in between those emission lines, that, that, that select that chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum and, and see that low, uh, um, brightness background, um, uh, avoiding the, uh, the starlight. So this, this is, again, this is really the concept behind Dragonfly and the drive for why they needed very narrow band filters for us. So one of the ways that Dragonfly as a telescope makes this possible is, you know, we're not comparing it to Galileo's or you know, my little benchtop uh, telescope. Uh, uh, for an amateur astronomer, you know, a, a large astronomical telescope, you know, we talk about a meter a refractor, it would be nearly impossible to make an optical one. Like we couldn't. I don't know who, anybody who could make an optical filter narrow that narrow and that uh, uniform across that large an aperture. Uh, so, so typically, uh, the optical filters are, are subsequently used at the uh, where the, the light is focused. But the, the consequence of that is, if you use a, a, an optical filter in the in the focused part of the beam instead of at the front of the the, uh, the telescope. Um, the multi-layer dielectric filters shift in wavelength with, ang with varying angles of incidence. So uh, even if you have a narrow filter, it's not going to work if you put it in the, the, um, the high F number or low F number part of the, uh, the beam because that wavelength is going to shift. Dragonfly, uh, because of its size, only 143 millimeter clear aperture, still big from a filter manufacturer point of view, I've got to say, but small enough that we're able to actually make a filter and the team at Dragonfly can put it in front of the lenses. They can tilt tune it. And because it's in front of the lenses, it's essentially working in an F ratio of infinity. Uh, so it, with a perfectly collimated beam. So the optical filter suffers none of that wavelength broadening and angle shift uh, um, associated with it if it was in the, uh, the, the low F number focused part of the beam. So this is really how Dragonfly was able to, uh, to benefit from these types of filters. But you still have to make the filters, and that's what we do. So these are still, even if it, if I can, if I say it's small uh, compared to a meter, it's still 150 millimeter uh, filter. And the the challenge is we need to make it extraordinarily uniform. So the the, the plot in the center bottom shows a, a, a contour plot where we take different measurements, many measurements across the entire clear aperture of this filter. There's no point just measuring it at the center. We need to map the filter and make sure that it's, it's good and good everywhere. A uh, picture on the bottom left is actually a picture of one of the filters themselves. Top left is that's the, the combination of measurements from all those spectral measurements at those different locations. So we're able to, even across the entire clear aperture, keep a, an open, um, uh, uh, aperture 
where we have good transmission everywhere across the filter and we don't have enough wavelength shift that, it, that it's gonna move off the peak. And this means we can make a narrow filter by making it this uniform and, and still work. We have a weighted average transmission of just in excess of a nanometer for this filter and a minimum transmission of, of far less than a, a nanometer wide for this filter. We, we have to, when we make the filters, not just control the center wavelength, we also need to control the full width half maximum, make sure that the, the bandwidth of the filter of every measurement across the, the image is the same, make sure that the transmission bandwidth is the same. So it's, it's really, uh, this is a, a, about controlling the uniformity of the filter. Earlier, I talked about optical filter manufacture and the key be, uh, one of the keys being in situ optical monitoring to make sure the design is actually um, on track in terms of the sh filter shape that's going to come out in the end. That's, that's true, but the, the, uh, the and, and it's still a challenge for optical filters, make sure you get the right shape. The challenge with Dragonfly is getting that right shape, but getting that right shape everywhere across a very large uh, clear aperture. Additionally, uh, it's a challenge because we didn't just have to do this once. Uh, Dragonfly has 150 different lenses, or 120 different lenses, sorry. So we've had to do this 120 plus times. Uh, and so you need to have a very uh, controlled performance across a filter and very controlled performance filter to filter. So that's really been a challenge, uh, exciting one. And we've been delighted to work with the team at Dragonfly and the U of T for the last, oh, I guess, five years now working on this and, and now getting to finally see the filters on the sky and getting results is, is truly exciting. So uh, in comparison, and, and this is sort of one of the, the, the filters that, that convinced us that Dragonfly would be feasible. And this is a slide that I discussed back in the, uh, the fall session. This is some work that we did for Earth observation. So this is a lightning imager, narrow band pass filter that we did for ESA's MediaSat uh, next generation or third generation uh, lightning imager just uh, launched in December successfully. Don't think data is coming down from it quite yet, but uh, successfully launched. And so again, we're excited to see what comes out of this. This was a, a filter we did uh, in conjunction with Leonardo and Talus, again, providing more signal and less background in this case, but with a very specific line, not H alpha, but an oxygen triplet at 777.4 nanometers. This had to be even more precise than Dragonfly. 10 picometer uh, control of center wavelength, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 100 picometer control over the, the clear aperture. The difference here is we really, we had to do this once. So you could, this, is, this is a hero. And uh, we were able to, to tr treat it as a hero run and, and the cost and, and challenges associated with it. But we were able to achieve, as you can see on the left, a, uh, this is a contour map of the filter where each color change is a 100 picometer step. So essentially, across the entire 125 clear, uh, uh, millimeter clear aperture of this filter is uh, the same to within plus or minus uh, 100 picometers. The tra trace on the upper right is not a trace, it's again uh, tra 69 different traces taken across that clear aperture uh, in that, that star pattern that I showed previously with Dragonfly. It, this filter is just so precise that all the traces lie completely on top of each other. Additionally, the full width half max is controlled to a sub 2% of the uh, a change in peak transmission sub 1%, so extraordinary wavelength control. And our ability to do this for the lightning imager inspired us uh, to be able to do what is actually a slightly sim uh, uh, simpler filter for, for Dragonfly and do it uh, many times. So while, while the filters we've done for Dragonfly don't need to be space qualified, these are terrestrial filters, they certainly could be. You could, you could use the same type of astronomical filters in a, uh, a um, uh, a space-based telescope. And so uh, our optical filters and our technology used to deposit them has been uh, characterized and, and qualified for, for use in space. Uh, mentioned the Earth observation, the uh, SATCOM filters. We have many hundreds of filters flying in low Earth orbit Earth observation with our customers and same in SATCOM, many, many optical filters flying currently and to be flying soon in uh, optical SATCOM systems. So we have qualified our filters for radiation exposure, thermal cycling, vibration, uh, all, the, all the typical tests that are needed to ensure that the filters are gonna work in space and work reliably. Finally, uh, the, this, this uh, Dragonfly was a great example of the way we like to work at Iridian where we partner with our, our customers uh, right from the beginning and then develop a spec together. The team at the university came to us and they knew what they wanted Dragonfly to do, but they didn't exactly know the optical filter specifications that they would need to have to achieve that requirement. But they were able to tell us about the functional requirements, 
some ideas and specifications. We went back and forth and iterated, put some, as they say, put some filters on the sky, took some measurements with them, and then changed design for the subsequent iterations. So we're, we're happy to work with customers at that proof of concept stage and then take it right through a high volume production. And the, the second bullet here is really uh, one of the key things that makes you really unique. Uh, because of the different uh, markets we deal with, telecom, spectroscopy, 3D cinema that Nicholas uh, mentioned in the introduction, we have uh, many different uh, uh, production processes associated with the different platforms and geometries and sizing and test. And so when something comes along like Dragonfly that needs its own size and shape and performance and, and process, we don't have a way we do, uh, do things. We have a toolbox of, of, of technologies available to us and we build a specific production process for the needs of that product. 